Foxy Lady, Kathy Etchingham, Jimi Hendrix's real-life girlfriend from back in the day. <clears throat> this movie about him is turned controversial because it it makes it appear that you know he would hit Kathy, that he uh, beat his girlfriend, and uh, everyone involved, including her, says nothing like that ever happened. Uh, Charles Cross was on yesterday talking a little bit about that and how I don't know why the uh, director of the movie did this, but uh, Kathy Etchingham wants to set the record straight. And who else better to do it? Kathy in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to the Bob River Show. How are you? Oh, well, thank you. Hey, it's late at night for you. It is. It thank, is. thank you for staying up. <laughs> You're welcome. We, uh, of course, in Seattle, love the legacy of Jimi Hendrix. We love his music. And we know lots of great things about him. So, and of course, uh, you know Charles Cross at all? Well, I have never met him, but I've spoken to him on the telephone. Uh, his biography of Jimmy, very well researched, uh, you know, sort of stands as a document that records as much as is, is known and interesting about him. Now, uh, this movie was coming out, and naturally they would want it in the Seattle Film Festival because... Jimi Hendrix was here, uh, you know, and, and is the biggest first Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member, a legend. And then when it comes out, uh, I saw a post on Facebook from Charles that said, wait a minute, Jimmy Denver did this and he didn't talk like that and uh, all, all sorts of things. And then I, reali I realized, because he had pointed it out, that you wrote about this back on September 15th of last year. How did you come to, and this is before the movie was even seen, right? Yeah. How did you hear well, about what it? Happened, uh, what happened was that somebody uh, sent me an email saying, do you know about this film called All Is By My Side? I replied, no, I don't know what, what film. <laughs> and so I started researching it on Google and everything. And I found that it was already in production and is coming to the end of its filming. So I sent an email to uh, John Ridley saying, oh, congratulations, doing the film and everything. Um, if you need any help, don't hesitate to contact me. Well, I didn't get a response. I didn't get a reply or, or even a thanks but no thanks. I got nothing. So it went on for a while. And um, then I started seeing interviews uh, with the actress playing my character, her name's Hayley Atwell. Mm -hmm. And she was describing me in the most <laughs> defamatory and derogatory terms. So, no, no, wait a minute. You actually offered, hey, guys, if you need any help, I'm yeah. the actual person. Uh, yeah. you, you can contact me. Isn't it yeah. odd? And, and by the way, the director of this is a very acclaimed director who... Uh, 12 Years a Slave. 12 Years a Slave. I, I assume they interviewed people and did uh, research about that. Interview no one. Huh. No one. I know everybody that knew Jimmy in those... No, no, no. I mean days. about 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> <laughs> that, that won an Oscar. Well, I mean, that was somebody else's story again, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. this is what he's done. He's taken my book, mm. used all of the material in my book, and done a derivative um, account of what I've said without my permission or anything. I sent him a letter through my lawyers saying, look, can we have a look at the script? Because I'm a bit concerned that this might be defamatory. And I got a letter back <laughs> threatening to sue me. Threatening to sue you for being yeah. the girlfriend who wants to say yeah. that this is not accurate. You keep your truth to yourself. You keep... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, that's weird. They're interfering with their rights under the First Amendment. Well, and, and that's a curious question, which I'm sure we'll find out more about. Under the First Amendment, uh, you know, accuracy in a movie, unless you're claiming it's 100 percent accurate, uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if it's required. Do you? Uh, apparently not. Hmm. Apparently, the First Amendment gives you complete liberty to say whatever you like. It doesn't really matter whether it's true or not, if it's in the film. Now you said this actress, uh, Haley Atwell, that plays you, Kathy, that she was doing interviews talking about you in very unflattering terms. What Absolutely. what kind of things were what kind of things were they alluding that you had done or or? Uh... I swear in every line that I use obscene language whenever I speak. 
that I am out of control, um, tempestuous, chain-smoking loudmouth, basically. Mm. I've gotten all of those except the chain-smoking. Yeah, you've done all of those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, by by the way, those did, the, did those accusations cause you to do some of that stuff? <laughs> yeah. Wow. You, you know what? Uh, I, I, I was absolutely flabbergasted. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? But I didn't in my wildest dreams think that they were going to portray Jimmy beating me up. Well, now, now so have I you... had no idea. When I wrote to them, first of all, I had no idea that this is how they were going to portray things, you see. So, so you point. were already upset before the movie came out just by the characterization, and then, they, yes. then you find out that he beats you up in the movie. Yes. How no, did you... I'm completely... I had You're crazy. I can hear Charles it. Uh, how, how did you I find that out? Charles Cross, under what circumstances were, was I being beaten up? Can you tell me what the situation <laughs> was where... Uh, because I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, Eric is here. Eric saw the film. Eric can answer any question you have. And by the way, he's one of those brainiacs with an absolutely, what do you call that kind of memory? Photographic. A photographic yeah. memory. See, I don't remember even what it's called. Here's Eric. Eric. Okay, greetings, Kathy. And I think, Kathy, we got connected because you heard an interview I did with Haley Atwell talking about you. I put it out on Twitter, that's and that's right. how you found that's it. That's right. And when she was saying, well, I, I think she was naive at the time. I wasn't at all. I had a tough upbringing, and because of that, I wasn't naive. <laughs> you know? All right, when you were uh, going out with Jimmy. Yeah. Right, so yeah. this, the when scene... When I met Jimmy, I was only 20 years old. I'll admit that I was young, uh, but you I was admit a to DJ that. Yeah. Yeah. in the clubs that were all the, the sort of rage at the time where all the groups used to go, and I used to play whatever they wanted to hear. So I was quite sort of well-informed about music, I knew everybody, um, and when I met Jimmy, um, everybody knew me. Everybody knew me. Um, and and <laughs> uh, according to this film, is that I heard Jimmy's music and immediately was like enthralled by it. This is not true. I hadn't heard Jimmy play at all because by the time I got to that club that night. He'd stop playing. Chaz had taken him off the stage because he didn't have a work permit and he wasn't allowed to, you know, work with or without pay. And so I, I didn't hear any of it. And Chaz saw me come down the stairs and say, Kathy, come over here, you know, meet, meet Jimmy. And that's how we met. And at this time, you were much more famous in London than Jimi Hendrix. You were Absolutely. More, you were Absolutely. the star. Far more <laughs> Far more well known than he was. Yeah. So, did you see him, and did you feel an immediate attraction that had no, nothing to do with him no, being a star? Sitting, oh no, no, no! I was sitting somewhere else. He was sitting next to Linda Keith. She got up to go to the to the ladies' room, and he, Paul, saw me and said, "Can I speak to you?" You know. Mm. And I moved over because of the music and everything to nearer to him. And he just whispered in my ear. He said, "Gosh, you're so beautiful." <laughs> wow! Uh, so he was, was. He was. He hit on so you. She, she <laughs> came back downstairs. Linda Keith came back downstairs. Started throwing things around, and, and you know, things got completely out of hand. And Chaz said, "Get him out of here! Get him out of here! Take him to the Hyde Park Towers Hotel, because if the police had been called, you know, Jimmy was there on a sort of just visitor's visa." Chaz didn't want any trouble. You know, this is his investment. And um, so I took him out of the club, and we walked up to Piccadilly from St. James's, and uh, I basically saved his life because he looked left instead of right. I walked into the road, and there was a taxi. You stopped him from being run over. Yeah, the wow. cars go the, the other whole way. Career. Over. I grabbed the back of his uh, coat. He had this sort of Mac thing grabbed him by the back of his coat and pulled him back. He was hit by the wing mirror only, oh. you know, so he wasn't injured. Well, but, I mean, that uh, just but for a few inches changes the course. Oh, well, it push. actually hit him. Yeah. It actually hit his chest. Wow. Um, but, but only slightly, <clears throat> you know, so he wasn't injured, no. So did you start? <laughs> did you start? I said, you've got to look. When you cross the road, you've got yes. to look to your right not your left. <laughs> Silly American. Uh, did you start uh, dating him right at that point? I mean, yeah. was it an instant? That yeah. was it. 
Yeah, yeah we were an item from that moment on. Mm. And the next morning, uh, Linda Keith burst into the hotel room where we in the Hyde Park Towers, grabbed this guitar, Jimmy's guitar, grabbed it by the neck, and lifted it over her head to bring it down on top of us. <laughs> we were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> you get it waxed with the guitar. Hey, so, <laughs> I, I almost hate to bring up the movie again because this is much more fascinating. But Eric oh, was going to well, tell you. Far more, he couldn't tell the real story, right. you see, because the real story would have been a ripoff of my copyright. <laughs> Oh well, why didn't he just? He had to. He had to fictionalize the stories. Why didn't he just license your book? Theft. Yeah. Why didn't he just license your book? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because he's an author himself. Well, everybody says that. Yeah. Everybody, my age, everybody says that. Why didn't he just license? Why didn't he just? Well, I might not have given it to him. Oh. <laughs> that, but that he might. That might have occurred to him. The fact of the matter is. What he's done, instead of, instead of acquiring the rights to my book, he's just simply plagiarized it. Right. And, but also in the telling, uh, changed it uh, so much that it's... Yes, uh, it's... That it's become a complete fictionalization. For example, the Michael X um, uh, scene. That's taken entirely from my book. That's never been reported anywhere else except for my book. The fact of the matter is that I was there with Jimmy... Not some fictional person called Ida. Michael X was a, well, I don't know what the word is in American, a standover man. What does that mean? Uh, you know, a um, bodyguard. A bodyguard. A bodyguard, no, yes. No, no, per- an enforcer. Oh, that's a bodyguard. Like oh, well. a, a guy that gets things done by going out and threatening you with violence. Yes, exactly. Oh, mafia. Some <laughs> landlord called. Like a thug. We call him a thug. We call him a thug. For a, a for a, a slum landlord called Reichman, who was imprisoned, and what what he did was he, in, he intimidated blacks and Irish to to, to leave their um, accommodation, and he pretended to be some sort of civil rights activist, <laughs> and he sucked everybody in. Uh, but Jimmy sussed him out within about twenty minutes of being in his place. Jimmy realized that this guy was a confidence trickster, you know, uh, extraordinaire. And he said, let's get out of here, Kathy, let's get out of here. We nearly fell over each other, falling down the stairs. Uh-huh. Out. And, and he's completely presented that uh, with some other black girl that wasn't there. So he, he changed the character completely. Eric, you saw this scene, right? Yeah, Eric, I, a, I, a little context, Eric, please. Yeah, and, and this guy, uh, Michael X... Uh, he was he was portrayed as an as an activist of like kind of like Malcolm X or, or Martin Luther King that that type. Michael X was a murderer. He was hanged in Trinidad mm. for murdering a white woman. He beat her and buried her alive, and he was hanged. Jimmy sussed this guy out straight away. Yeah, Jimmy knew this undesirable person. Jimmy was smart. He'd lived, you know, by his. On, on the streets, basically, by his own means, he knew that this guy was a... Um, he knew very quickly that this guy was um, a confidence trickster and, a, you know, a, a nasty person. And here he's being portrayed as some wonderful civil rights leader that we should all look up. And to. the only only account of that was in your book, so he had to get yeah. the story. And that's where they stole I'm, that. I'm wondering, Kathy, here in Seattle, we are so proud that Jimi Hendrix was born here and raised here, but it seems once Jimi went to London and, and that's where he really found his fame, he didn't come back to Seattle very much, and I never heard him talk much about being from Seattle or anything. Did he ever talk to you about Seattle and growing up here? Yes, he did. He talked about Seattle quite a lot. It was his birthplace, you know. It's like any... When we were young, we used to talk about where we came from because when we were younger, you know, when you're young, you're nearer the time that you were there, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all much older now. Right. And and I used to talk about where I was born and, and... and he used to talk about where he was born and what he used to do. We, t- yeah, mm-hmm. he, I knew he came from Seattle. <laughs> mm-hmm. So he, he, he talked knew to where him. I came from. In right. Fact, he 
said, Kathy Etchingham, he says, Kathy's my past girlfriend, my present girlfriend, friend, and probably my future girlfriend, my Yoko Ono from Chester. Wow. What a nice there thing. You uh, Kathy. And he said that in 1969. I must have gone through about 15,000 beatings by then. <laughs> by then, yes, according to this movie. All right. Wow. Kathy, that's the controversial thing. Let's get to that. Eric, describe the scene that she. Have you not seen it yet, Kathy? No. You have not seen it. We, no, but I've had um, lots of people have been to see it in private viewing sure. and, and at film festivals, that I, people that I know, who've made copious notes okay. and Is, have told me what's in it. They're all completely, they, they don't even know how to tell me what they've seen. <laughs> right. So I, I er, say, no, give it to me. Just be straight and give it to me, you know. So Eric, is there is there anything you would like to know today from Eric, who just freshly saw it. Well, he, when did he see it? Just recently? Yeah. Yep. Well, one of the scenes I was told about is that um, when Jimmy arrived in London, uh, he went to, he went to uh, well, it would have been um, um, uh, a house where I lived. Zoot Money lived downstairs. And that I woke up and drank a glass of wine. And said, oh, no, I don't want to get up this morning. Was that in the film, or has that been cut out? Well, it wasn't clear why you didn't get up. You, you didn't want to come downstairs for some reason. I didn't know whether you drank wine or, or something. You just seemed a little hungover in the movie. Uh -huh. uh, you well, seemed hungover yeah. in the movie. <laughs> that gets everything wrong about you. See, uh. what's happened is that they've cut lots of pieces out after, after my complaints. Oh. And that's why it's a bit choppy. Ah. And I know this has happened. Um, the, 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 the original editors were replaced by two new editors that did um, Malik's films. And people say, well, it, it seems to cut off places. Well, I think that they portrayed me in a much worse light originally. But considering what I'd said in my lawyer's letter, they reconsidered and took out some parts of it. Wow. Kathy Etchingham. Kathy, uh, I want to uh, shift just a little bit because uh, we got it. We got, we got what you feel about the movie, and it sounds like it's well documented in your book. I'd like to put up a link to your book so people can buy it and hear your story. But I also want to hear just a little bit of your story from your book about the good times, about, uh, about the, the ex good. exciting success and being with yeah. Jimmy during those I times. I was there. On that trajectory, you know, we're, he just started from nowhere. Chaz had a business plan that he'd worked out with Jimmy before they came to England. It was done in New York. So there was already a business plan written out. Uh, and in fact, recently, Hilton Valentine, who was the bass player with the Animals, said the same thing. He said Chaz Chandler had a business plan all worked out before Jimmy even came to England. And so when, we, when he arrived, I mean, you know, Chaz was delighted that he was with me because uh, um, Linda Keith was, you know, <laughs> what shall I say? You just got to read um, Keith Richards' book. You know, she was out of her head on drugs and completely out of control. Her parents made her a ward of court and put her into rehabilitation. So he was very pleased that he, you know that he was with somebody who wasn't a, a lunatic. And you were you were pretty you were a stabilizing influence. Yes, absolutely, yeah, mm. definitely. I mean, I didn't take drugs, and I didn't um, had two jobs. I worked as a DJ in the evening and a hairdresser during the day. Wow! And I managed to do that and get enough sleep in between. Well, just enough sleep in between. Eventually, it all got too much for me, and I gave up the day job because right. couldn't how, couldn't do both because I wasn't getting enough sleep. How did you feel time. about how did you feel about the song "Foxy Lady," and how do you feel when you hear it today? <coughs> it doesn't it doesn't move me. <laughs> Come on. No, it doesn't. What does move me? Strangely enough, are not songs that he wrote about me all along the watchtower because I remember the recording of that being in the studio where we all 
stood on the chair on the was like a sort of banquette, you know, like a like a long sofa. Uh huh. And he did it in one take. Wow. And we just went, oh, what? <laughs> Dave Mason was there, and I think uh, Brian Jones was there. I'd gone back earlier to get another guitar from the flat. In a, I went back in a taxi because the guitar he had, Jimmy was very particular about his guitars. There was some he loved, some he didn't care about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and, as we uh, as we saw, I mean, some of them they, they were a little mistreated. Yeah. yeah, some of them were treated yeah. like they said you were treated in the film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was the tars he was hitting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> set, her on, set her on fire. Let's. <laughs> yeah, he set you on fire at least five times. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> So the other songs move you because uh, you have specific memories of being a yes. part of them recorded. And Foxy Lady absolutely, to yeah. you? Absolutely. Because I was there when they were recorded. I was there when we Wind Cries Mary. But I don't know, for some reason, that particular song and the lead up to how it was uh, created. Well, well, he didn't create it. It was Bob Dylan. But how he came to decide to do it. Mm. Uh, was torment for him, you know? Why, why torment? Bob, Bob Dylan was his idol, and, and they, oh, God, you know, cop, you know, doing one of his, oh, you know, I'll be criticized, oh, you know, and all Oh, of I it. see. Hmm. Do it, just do it, just do it. You want to do it, just do it, don't worry about what Bob Dylan and thinks. And even Bob yeah. Dylan has said, that's the best version Definitive you're ever going to hear, of, that's version. of the, no. all along the Watchtower. You, if you'd have been in the studio that night, and there weren't many of us in there, there was just the engineer... And Jimmy and, and, and Brian and, and Dave and a couple of other people floating around. Mm. And we all just sat there, yeah, let's have a cigarette. Because <laughs> everybody smoked in those days. It didn't matter where you were. Kathy, uh, can I say and something? He started and he just <clears throat> yeah. went straight into it. And it just was phenomenal. Mm. Kathy? It was just uh, electrifying. Kathy? Yes? You are a ball of energy. You've always been this way, haven't you? Yes. What an amazing... I can see why Jimmy was so taken with you. Uh, you you went on and lived a full life, uh, and, and you've had... Uh, are you still... Are you married now, or are you... Yes, I've been married for 30, 38 years. 38 years. Is this... Does your, uh, does your present husband, whom I'm sure you absolutely adore and have a wonderful life together, does he like hearing about Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> Just curious. He's a very, very... Um, open-minded mm. person that he just doesn't care. He knows my history. Mm. I told him when I met him, he accepted that, and he doesn't, yeah. Beautiful. He, he knows. He, he knows. He, he's a doctor. A doctor. Wow. Of course. Yeah. And, he, and he knows that people have to live with their history. You can't start shoveling a hole and stuffing it in there, you know. Mm-hmm. And hoping no one will find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sat in one of the most uh, special places you could in history, musically. There was nothing like London in the late 60s, and yeah. it sounded like you uh, had... It was wonderful. We had a wonderful time. I can't tell you what fun we had. Mm. And, and apparently this uh, film portrays all sort of, you know, chattering in clubs and nobody saying anything, the drugs and everything. It wasn't like that. Jimmy had already had two, two hits. As far as I can remember, it was Hey Joe that went to number six. We sort of remember Chaz coming in saying, It's gone to number six. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then there was uh, The Wing Cries Mary. But he'd already written and recorded Are You Experienced by May. Now, that's uh, at least a month before he went to Monterey. So how did he do all this <laughs> if he was just down in clubs mumbling? And, you know, right, right. <laughs> You know, it's just appalling, you know, and, and, and women having to tell him what to do. I would never have told Jimmy what to do. Um, Jimmy knew exactly what to do. He was already accomplished by the time he got to England. His hair was already the way it was when he got to England. You just got to look at the photographs. Kath at Kathy, um, we're a little bit out of time. Eric wants to ask one more question. Okay. I'd love to find a way to get you to screen the film. Uh, but I guess maybe they don't want you to see it. I don't know. Here's Eric. Go ahead, they Eric. They don't want me to see it, no. 
Yeah. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to send you a link, although I probably shouldn't, but I will. Um, and maybe, let's not mention that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. But, but, Kathy, my question is, why did you and Jimmy break up? Well, what happened is that I went to New York in early 1969, and there were all these hangers-on, um, and people coming around to the hotel room, and they were all sort of, you know, I don't know, borrowing money, um, I, I don't, borrowing his clothes, and, and he's going, oh, that's okay, that's okay, and everything. And then this guy came around, and he, I'll never forget his name. His name was Harry Krantz. And I wasn't allowed to put his name in my book in case he came along and sued me, but I, I, I don't care, because he's probably dead by now, because he was about 45 then. Then, yeah. And he had a bag, and he put it down on the floor, and it gaped open, and on the top of all this, there was, it had all this white powder. And I didn't really know what the white powder was, but I knew what was on top of it. It was a gun. Mm. Uh, I've never seen a gun in my life before. And when I first saw it, I thought, ah, oh, this is not a real gun, is it? And then I realized it was. And I, you know, something kicked in. <laughs> and I just, this is just too much. And I went home. I went back to England pretty quickly after that. Wow. And then I just said, look, I think, you know, things are getting a bit out of hand. And, I, you know, my ambition was to be happy and have children and everything else. It uh, wasn't to be uh, right. getting into drugs and guns. Did you ever replay that in your mind and wonder what might have happened had you tried to stay and be a, a stabilizing influence? Or did you think, no, it was just too much for me and that's the way it was? It was too much for me. Yeah. It, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have lasted. Definitely not. My personality was developing. To you know, I was 20 years old. By the time that I saw this gun, I was like 23 mm. um, or getting on for 23. And I was getting more mature. And I was beginning to realize what was going on around me. And to me, I mean, uh, New York was like a, an alien planet um, in those days. It was just, <laughs> I don't have any of this going on. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be back in London, you know, where I was secure, where my friends were. And, um, yeah, that's, so that was it. And I said, oh, I'm going to go back. And that's what I did. Yeah. Kathy, and, uh, uh, I, I can't help but thinking there's got to be another movie, and you have to be consulted. Well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's been movies before where I've been omitted completely um, because they didn't even know I existed because I have kept a low profile. I mean, that's I did hard to imagine. a book, and it was out of print for many years. Yeah. Uh, and when I heard about this film, I republished it. Ah. Because I thought people ought to know the truth because I republished it on Amazon. All right. So, so it, I mean, it can be downloaded onto a, you know, a, a uh, re, an e-reader. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So in a weird way, the film uh, can have, uh, you know, can have a positive effect for you. The book is Gyp, uh, Gypsy Eyes. Through Gypsy Eyes, Gypsy Kathy. Eyes, and it's available on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, Kathy Etchingham. Kathy, we are going to put. How, how are the book sales now? <laughs> dim. They're dim. The, the sales are dim, <laughs> folks. Won't you help? Yeah. Uh, Gyps, through Gypsy Eyes, Kathy Etchingham. Kathy, we're going to put it on our website, BobRivers.com. I wish we could talk for a day or two because I think we, I think, I don't think we'd run out of stuff. Uh, thank, I don't think so. Yeah. Thank you for staying story. up. It's a long story. <laughs> All right. And, and he did. I mean, people say that he hated Seattle and everything. He never said that to me. All right. Good to know. And, uh, Kathy, we may be back in touch again. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All the best. Kathy Etchingham there. We'll be right back.